The next speaker that we have this afternoon is Missy Shaw, who's the teacher coach from Dodgeland. One of the reasons that I asked Missy to speak this afternoon is because over the years, as I've watched the uh, mock trial list, one of the things I've noticed is one of the most active people, at least as far as I can see, in organizing scrimmages has been Missy. And scrimmages, as many of you know, are a really good way to prepare your students. But there are, I've learned over the years when I was coaching that there were better scrimmages and worse scrimmages. And that how somebody sets up a scrimmage can matter a lot, both from who you scrimmage against, from when you do it, from what you tell the judges about the scrimmage. Um, and I've also judged quite a few scrimmages. And let me tell you, it really is helpful as a judge, and I'm just putting, if you're scrimmaging, to tell me whether you want me to judge normally or whether you want me to judge and ignore certain things. Because sometimes early scrimmages, you may not want me jumping on every objection. You may want me worrying more about whether they're actually developing their crosses and their directs. But in any event, I asked Missy to speak on scrimmages, and here she is. OK, as a teacher, I find it very difficult to sit. So sitting all afternoon has been driving me nuts. So I'll try not to wander and remember that I'm pinned to our podium here for the microphones. Um, so the title of this is Scrimmages. It's not sport, just for sports. Um, the reason why I put this in is that so often when we hear about a scrimmage, we're relating this to some kind of athletic game or athletic event. But practicing for mock trial is just like practicing for any other athletic event. You need to get out there and see other teams to see how you can perform and stand up and compare to them. And so that's really the purpose of making sure that you have scrimmages. But before I get into that, just a little bit about me. Um, my name is Melissa. I'm known as Missy Shaw. Um, I'm from the Dodgeland School District. I actually went to Dodgeland School District in my high school days. I now coach with my coach from mock trial days back and way back. Um, Joe Moore is, our, is a former public defender um, in Dodge County, and he started the program about 30, well, 25, 26, however many years old we are now, um, years ago at Dodgeland. I then came back um, after college, right after college, and took a science position in the middle school and took over as the head coach for mock trial. My information is there. That is my school number, 386-4404, extension 1318. Um, 920 is an area code. Please give me a call if you would like a scrimmage or if you have any questions. And then I also have my email address available for you um, to have that direct line because I'm the one that abuses the, the WISMAC um, listserv by accidentally replying to it. So <laughs> that's the one downfall of that listserv. Drives you nuts. Um, so there's a little bit about me. As far as Dodgeland's concerned, we have 243 students in our high school about 24 of them are on my team. I actually have a larger mock trial team than most of our sports are right now. Um, does that mean that we're good? We don't usually make it to state, but you know something? They like to participate and they do really well when they participate in the regionals. And so we do kind of um, tote that banner that we are larger than most of our sports activities right now. Um, and so we're pretty proud that we've grown to that extent. Um, I'm at 21 right now. It should be hitting 24 probably by the end of the week. So that's where we are at Dodgeland. Now, scrimmages kind of can be broken up into two different categories. We have the nighttime weekday scrimmages and we have the weekend scrimmages. And there's advantages and disadvantages of both of those. And I'll talk about both of them separately and what those advantages and disadvantages are. Um, but you really need to think about what works best for your students. I am from a small school. My students are in everything. And I do work with our athletic um, coaches. I have students who are on the boys basketball team and play varsity. I have girls who are on the um, girls basketball team and play varsity. I work around their schedules. They work around mine. The only one team that I cannot work with is wrestling and the reason is is that wrestling regionals are the same day as our regionals and so it's anticlimactic to have people c come with you all the way through the season just to find out they have to choose um, and so I just tell them up front I'm sorry if you're a wrestler I just can't take you on so that is one thing to know about is that you have to be cognizant of the fact that your students don't just do mock trial 
All right, so nighttime scrimmages. Well, there are some things to consider. First of all is your choice of venue. You can do a scrimmage in a school classroom, which is some of the most common ones that we have. Um, you could do scrimmages in your local courthouse. Now, Juno is the county seat of Dodge County. Lynn Ron is our clerk of courts, and she is really, really easy for me to work with. I call her up and say, Lynn, do you have any courtrooms that are available after 3 p.m.? She'll say yes or no. If she does, she's more than willing to let us come in and use those courtrooms. But we're lucky that because we're a smaller county, the people there are very supportive and they are more than willing to stay after their hours to make sure that we can get scrimmages in. Now, we have also done scrimmages in a courthouse centrally located to the teams. I have scrimmaged in West Bend at their courthouse. Um, that happened, I, it wasn't centrally located, but we were scrimmaging Kewaskum, so they came a little bit, we went a little bit, we ended up meeting in the middle. And so don't limit yourself to you going somewhere or they're coming by you. You can sometimes find in between spots. Public libraries, we almost had a scrimmage last year in the Jefferson Public Library um, with a team from Janesville. Uh, and so that was just a centrally located area. They had a public, public meeting room. As long as it was for a school, it didn't cost any money. Um, and then also city halls or community centers. We have a community center um, in a town just south of us that they have offered us to be able to use that. City halls are usually good for having meeting rooms as well. So don't limit yourself to your school or the other team's school or a courthouse. Think about other public buildings, especially when you're talking about cost of busing. And I'll talk more about that later as far as trying to meet with each other. Now, timing is another issue. And, <laughs> and I wish Joe was here because I, he and I, every year I have to remind him, Joe, I can't just yank kids out of school. I can't just leave at 2 o'clock and go to a scrimmage. It doesn't work that way. Some schools it might. My school it doesn't. It's amazing. We can have cross-country runners leave at 1.30 in the afternoon, but if I'm leaving for mock trial, I better wait till 3. So it's just however your school runs. And so you have to be cognizant of that, of that as well, that release time for students is sometimes difficult. And as well as finding a sub for yourself, um, especially those of you who are teachers, you understand the costs associated with that with your district and some of the bureaucracy that goes along with finding yourself a sub. You also, of course, need to be cognizant of sports conflicts or other academic academic extracurricular conflicts. Right now we're in the middle of our musical. Can we start practices right now? No, half of our team is on the stage. And so that's another thing that you have to worry about. Travel time's another big thing. Make sure that you limit yourself to what you can safely do in a night. Remember that it takes you an hour and a half to run around. So now you have to think about what is important to me? Do I want to run two rounds so that we can flip and do both sides? Then we're talking about three hours in the scrimmage itself. So how far am I willing to travel in order to seek out that scrimmage? And then of course we're back to busing issues. And then of course the length of the scrimmage. It's really kind of hard to go and only do one side. You almost have to plan on doing a three hour scrimmage so that your team can do both sides. Now there are ways to cut down on your time. If you're looking at only being able to spend two hours at a scrimmage, for instance we went to PLI, which is a school in inner city Milwaukee, um, where we said to them, you know, we need to be home by a certain time because I had kids that had to get to a game. And they said, okay, no problem. What can we do? Well, you can get rid of your opens and closes. That's one thing you can do. Um, you can limit cross-examination time. You can limit which witnesses perform. Um, those types of things can always happen. The other thing that I didn't put on here that we should mention as well is this idea that if you can't get all of your students to go with you, talk to the other team and use their witnesses. It is so good for your lawyers to use different witnesses. It's so good for your witnesses to hear other lawyers try to direct you. It's a fantastic experience for them. I have went to um, McGuanago last year for a, a scrimmage. And while we were there, I think I had about three quarters of a team. The other team had about three quarters of a team. And guess what? We just ended up mashing them all together. As long as we had a direct and a cross for every witness and we had somebody who could play each witness, we just ran it. In fact, I couldn't even say it was us against them because both teams were mashed together. And so that's actually really valuable um, for our students because our students then are, fine, are hearing other people try to tell their case through their direct questions without it being our script per se. So that's also valuable. So don't, all, don't limit yourself either by the fact that, oh, this one student can't go. Take somebody else, let them fill in, or go ahead and use somebody else's 
team in order to help you fill in. All right, other considerations. Number of teams participating in the scrimmage. Um, I've had it before. If I only have one team, and let's say that Janelle comes over from Lodi and she has three teams, I might call up somebody nearby, Mayville, Beaver Dam, somebody like that. They'll come in and fill in against those teams. Um, but remember that the more teams you have, the more time you're going to be spending in that nighttime scrimmage. So that kind of limits you as well. The number of rounds, of course, as we mentioned before, the length of time allowable to, scr to scrimmage, which I men mentioned, and then the judging of the rounds. This is where it gets tricky. Generally, when we scrimmage, we use our own attorney coaches or teacher coaches as the judges. And that is valuable because sometimes you're hearing from another team how their lawyer would handle something or how their attorney coach would handle something. And that's good for your students to hear. Um, but you need to limit them to the number of comments that they're giving. And I'm even, I'm guilty of it when I act as presiding judge, where I will just kind of go down every single point and go through it. I was a debater in high school, so I'm used to going point by point. Um, but that's not useful. So you want to make sure that when you judge the rounds, you're looking at the overall oral critiques similar to what they might be receiving at regionals. Um, that's how we usually do it, at least. We don't ever use the ballots in our scrimmages, and that's because kids get hooked, just like with grades, they get hooked on numbers. And so those ballots to our students indicate a grade. If you're only getting a five out of 10, you're failing. That's how they see it. If you're getting a nine out of a 10, then you're getting an A. And so our students get way too, my students at least, have gotten way too hooked onto the balance to numbers. And so we don't look at the ballots. We um, just do oral critiques and general statements. You also need to worry about food. And I, my first year, I've been coaching for 12 years now. This is my 12th year. Um, my first year, I forgot all about food because, you know, we're adults. We can go till 8 o'clock at night without eating because we do it all the time. Students can't go past 3 o'clock without eating. And so the kids are sitting on the bus. Oh, are we going to stop? Are we going to stop? Um, no, why would we stop? Well, I didn't bring anything to eat. Why didn't you bring anything to eat? You didn't tell me I had to. Well, how long did you think we were going to be gone considering we're traveling an hour and a half away? <laughs> you know, they don't think that far. And so you do have to think about food. Um, and then also worry about their time as far as getting their homework and stuff done. I mean, they have enough trouble getting those things fit into their schedule. They aren't, a lot of them, especially the younger ones, just aren't quite up on time management yet. And so as much as you can help them figure out, don't forget, we're going to be leaving at 3. We won't be home till 8 o'clock tonight. That essay due for English tomorrow should be written before we leave. Okay? And, and then you go through that with them. And that's something that your teacher coaches can certainly help on. And then, of course, volunteers as well is another consideration. Um, I do have, because I have connections with the Dodge County area and being in the county seat and growing up there all my life, um, it's very simple for me to get volunteers in order to judge. I can call on retired judges, retired lawyers, all kinds of things um, that have known me since I was a baby, and they come in pretty easily to help me with my scrimmages. Uh, the other part, though, is for our courthouse in Dodge County, we have metal detectors on the way in. So we have to get there before the courthouse closes, and we have to leave within a reasonable amount of time of when the custodial staff is there because of the whole metal detector issue. Um, so make sure that when you set up things in, scrim in um, courthouses that you're cognizant of their time schedule as well. So those are nighttime scrimmages. Um, any questions on nighttime ones? I mean, they aren't hard to set up. It's really send out on the listserv, I want a scrimmage, where are you located? Nobody knows where Dodge County is, so I hear you if you're from another small burg. I have to explain it all the time. I'm only 45 minutes north of Madison and 45 minutes north of Milwaukee. Draw a triangle, there we are. Um, so a lot of those things come into play as well. We are right off of 151, about seven miles. South, uh, we're about 45 minutes south of Fond du Lac. So the, draw the bigger triangle, we're in the middle. <laughs> All right, now weekend scrimmages. This is the one that I started two years ago. Um, I like to think I'm getting a little bit better at these as time goes on, but they're a lot more complicated. And as I was writing this, I'm like, you know, planning these things is like planning a wedding. It really is. The parts of a weekend scrimmage is really similar to running your wedding. Um, so that's how I kind of broke it down. 
As you are planning your wedding, the first thing you think about is location. Everything is about location. Now, some people are able to get their courthouses on weekends. I am not, and the reason is is that I refuse to ask for my courthouse on the weekend. Why? Because Dodge, Dodge County's courthouse is region blah, blah, blah. Last year it was 12, some years it's been 13. It holds regionals for us. Their people are already volunteering an entire Saturday for us. I refuse to ask them to volunteer another Saturday for me. And so I just, I don't even put it on the table. I don't even ask. And that's also because they also keep open at night for me two or three times during the months of December and January. So I don't ask. Um, so the courthouse, of course, is an option if, for some of you, for me, it's just not. Um, my school is the biggest option. Why? Because we are a K-12 facility. I have a gazillion rooms I can choose from. And so getting rooms is not a problem. That and generally on weekends, what's being used? Your gym. What's the one room you're not going to use for mock trial? Your gym. So generally, you're able to get your school in order to host these weekend meets. Now, community center, my community center has also offered. Um, I had one weekend where I was in a conflict with another thing going on, and the community center said, hey, we could put up dividers, you can do it here, and we worked it out anyhow. But our community center has offered to help us as well. And then other buildings that might be available, but make sure that they don't cost you anything, because generally you don't want to charge other people to come to your scrimmage. And you want to make sure that there's enough rooms to accommodate multiple teams. If you're going to do a weekend scrimmage, it's not worth it unless you have a lot of teams there. It's just, otherwise, the amount of time that you put into it, if you're going to take kids away from their families for a weekend, make it a full day and make them go four rounds. And the reason is, is that it builds their stamina. They don't realize what it means to do four rounds until they do a full day scrimmage. And four rounds is exhausting. And I told them, it's not the physical exhaustion, it's the mental exhaustion. And they had have no clue until we hit our January scrimmage. And then when we hit that day, they're just like, ugh. And I mean, they can't even put desks back in a row at the end of that day. So it's, it's a good experience to make sure that they build up that stamina. All right, Saturdays are the most common. Some districts have policies against Sundays. My district has a policy against Sundays. I am not allowed to hold practices on Sundays. I am not allowed to go to scrimmages on Sundays. And so if I wanted to, I could go to the board and ask for permission to do it, and they only meet once a month, so I would have to plan that now in order to get that to happen. Um, but Saturdays, of course, are the most common. Check your district calendar. And now this is for those teachers, generally, and I'm speaking from the point of view of a teacher because my poor lawyer coach, he's been doing this for 25 years, he has no clue what I go through to do the scrimmage, none. None. He just thinks I wave my wand and poof, and there it is. And bless his heart, he does a wonderful job, but he just doesn't quite understand. Um, the first thing I have to do is check my district calendar. We run community events in our school. And by running at community events in our school, I'm competing not only with people within our school, but with these events outside, 4-H, basketball, volleyball all kinds of other things. And I've had conflicts with basketball tournaments going on. The problem with that is that then I need to find another large room to put everybody in where they can keep their stuff safe. And the commons is not available when we're running these tournaments. So you need to check your district ca calendar. That's the first thing. Then you need to check with your team members for conflicts. Are they going to be able to get off of work? That's a big deal. And that's why I set this date early. Then check for the building use and availability schedule, and of course, the wonderful paperwork that goes with it. Um, so once you get all of that set, then you can kind of know where you're going to be. Now, you may choose a date, but your building's not available. You may choose the building, but the date's not available. And so this is where it kind of becomes like your wedding oh, but I really wanted to have my reception here at this time. Well, guess what? It's not available. So either pick a different date or pick a different venue. Um, all right, so how long of a tournament do you want and how far are your guests traveling? If I have people coming from Milwaukee area, I am not going to ask them to come for a little two-hour scrimmage. It's just not worth their time. If I'm asking them to give up their Saturdays, I'm going to run a four a four. Um, round scrimmage and that's just the end of it I, I just refuse to make people travel and because I have teams coming Berlin used to come by me I have teams coming from Madison I have teams coming from Milwaukee we will always run a four round scrimmage because of that 
All right, invitations. Of course, we have the listserv, and that's the, the main one. Um, once I get it out there on the listserv, then I tend to get a list of people that I keep in contact with until that date in order to get them coming. Uh, I do send out a Google Doc form, and I don't know if the internet is going to agree with me here. Where's my cursor? Nathan was having this problem, too. There it is. If I can get the Google Doc form up. This is just a Google Doc form. For those of you who are in education, you're probably very familiar with Google Docs now. If you're not, it's really easy. It's um, a free service. You go to googledocs.com, you put in your email address, you set up an account, and they give you forms that you can do. All I did was type in some of the things, and then here's my form. Now here's the upside of the form. It then compiles all my, oh, of course. If that's my right password, no. Is it? Oh, not today, okay. <laughs> Poof. Um, all right, so what's nice about this form is that it gives me this beautiful spreadsheet. And this is actually two years worth of spreadsheets on one because I don't, re don't send it out. But it's nice because it tells me the date that the person registered on, it tells me the school name, it tells me the coach, it tells me their email address, the contact information, everything that was on that form is now on a spreadsheet. And so I use this form all the time. I used it also when I used, well, I still host Forensics Meets too. Um, but it's really nice to, to organize your information together. Now, it's a free service. I would encourage anybody to use it. It's way easier than trying to keep track of your emails. I can't keep track of my emails. I have 10,000 emails on my school thing right now. And I have to search for every single one of them. So I use Google Docs instead. Um, now. Don't forget that you might want to limit your number of guests. But be careful when you limit your number of guests because inevitably they pull out at the last minute. Inevitably. All of a sudden you are getting the call at 6 p.m. on Friday night, my team can't come because. And that's about that time where I say, I don't really care why your team can't come. Thanks for letting me know. Goodbye. Um, but no, it's all right. But you do want to allow, so what I do is I allow everybody who wants to come to come because I say it'll all come out in the wash anyhow later on when people start dropping. Um, we can accommodate, I have what's nice, our middle school wing is a square and in that square I have four very large rooms so I usually take, plus other rooms, I usually take eight to sixteen teams um, and then some. And so I allow, I've allowed up to about twenty to register and I usually end up between ten and twelve somewhere in there. I know, which I sit there and then I think to myself, God, that's bigger than our regional. But whatever, it's good. <laughs> it's all good. Um, all right, so your reception. So you get into your rounds, you run a couple rounds. Nobody really cares about the stuff leading up to it. The kids care about lunch because that's where they get their food. And again, as we know, if you don't tell the kids to bring a lunch, they won't think of it. So I have tried different things. Um, first of all, we look at timing, I try to mimic the regional schedule. That means round one and two, break round three and four. And I do generally try to give them no definite time for the starting of round three. Why? Because at regionals, I don't think I've ever been given a definite time for round three. It's always been, oh look, they're all still going, so in 20 minutes we're gonna start round three. Okay, I'm gonna inhale my food and go. So I tend to do that, and what I do is I start we feed them lunch or they bring their lunch um, and then I just go from coach to coach and say okay are you guys ready to go and then we say five minutes go and that's when we start our next round. But I do that because I want to teach kids flexibility and I want them to learn that not everything is rigid and that's really hard for those of us who are type A and linear sequential people and our students that are that way as well. Um, but it's a life lesson to learn. Um, how long of a break do you want? Like I said, I go around and I just kind of look to make sure everybody's done eating and we're good to go. What do you feed them? Um, I have done on-campus concessions. Here's the upside. Call your parents. Make them work the concession stand for you. I shouldn't say make. Ask them to. They'll do it. That concession money usually goes into your pockets then for the busing and other things that you need. Um, I have tried other on-campus options such as bringing in things like Domino's Pizza and soda and telling them $5 all you can eat, go. 
Um, the problem with that was that people signed up for it. I put that on my form, they signed up for it, and then they decided to bring their own meals. And I ended up stuck with literally 16 pizzas because people decided not to eat suddenly. So, yeah. Um, so I would stay away from that. Concessions are good because you usually only get charged for what you use. And then food available in the area. Well, Juneau is a town of 2,800. Woohoo! We have Subway across the road. If you have Subway across the road, you better call Subway and tell them that you're hosting this, especially if you're urging people to go there. Um, I have also made deals with Subway. They will do uh, sandwiches, six inch subs for you, where you can sell them for about three bucks a piece. You make a profit and you can get ham, turkey, roast beef, and then they put their own toppings on. Um, but again, then you're paying for things that might not get used. And then of course, bring your own. And so what I did last year is I said, bring your own, but we'll have concessions open. But um, like I said, at our school, at least if I open concessions, I know that the money that I make goes in, my, goes in mock trials pocket, so. All right, logistics. Here are some things to worry about. Scheduling, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about scheduling on the next slide, but make sure you're allowing time for oral comments. Like I said, we don't stick to the ballots with the numbers on. Kids don't like them, they fixate way too much on them. Uh, the judges, I have done it where, or this is what I usually do. I tell people, bring a judge for every team you have. And then what I do is I schedule the rounds and I say, okay, between you two teams, figure out who's presiding. If two of you wanna preside, go ahead. If one of you wants to preside, go ahead. It doesn't matter to me, just figure it out. And because we're so laid back, I think that's why it's been so successful because it ends up that by the end of the day, all you see is a clump of kids roaming the halls talking to each other and a bunch of coaches talking strategy with each other. It's no longer me against them, it's how do we work together to help all of our students that are here. And so I think the laid back atmosphere has helped with that. Um, now I will warn you, because if you are the teacher coach or the attorney coach hosting, do not expect to see your kids perform. It's not gonna happen because you're running around helping other people. Um, and that's kind of been the hard thing for my attorney coach to, to understand as well is that because I'm hosting, I can't be in the room watching the students. And when there's only two of us and we're running two to three teams on our, for, through Dodgelin, it becomes kind of difficult and cumbersome. So what have I done? I have gotten a hold of alumni from Dodgelin who are now lawyers. And some of them will even come out of Milwaukee. One's a public defender in Milwaukee. She comes out and does some judging for me. Um, I also call up my friends at the Dodge County Bar and say, hey, I'm having this scrimmage, can you come and help me out? And then that kind of frees me up to go see some of my students. Um, making sure the, bed, the building is ready to go. Custodial staff, you gotta keep them happy. The custodial staff really needs to be kept happy because they're coming in on the weekend and yeah, they might be getting paid overtime, but really they're giving up their Saturday for you. Um, and really, what do you need to make sure? You need to make sure your bathrooms are open because that's the first place they go. As soon as the buses unload, that's where they're going is the bathroom. Lights are on, rooms are unlocked. That's the big thing. And then team meeting rooms. Um, what I do with team meeting rooms is that we have, since we're in a square, I have the outside rooms being where they compete, the inside rooms are where they can go. And those team meeting rooms are open to anybody at any time. They come and go as they please. And then I learn after the first year, I am not a coffee drinker. Apparently everybody else in the free world is. So <laughs> I learned really fast, I have to get to school by 6.30 so I can start the big 30 cup coffee maker. And we put that just on a counter somewhere and say, everybody, there it is, go. And it's free for everybody, just go and take it. Um, because like I said, I'm not a coffee maker. And after the first year, I was land blasted with, where's the coffee? I'm like, whoa, I don't drink it, I'm sorry. So a note about schedules, because it's a scrimmage, I don't worry about team, team anonymity. I put a key at the top of the schedule and I use, you know, X is for Xavier, um, MA is for Mayville. They come, they know what it is. You know who you're going against. I do though worry about regional assignment. Um, by January, we're getting too close to the meet to not worry about that. And so what I do tend to do is I look at my first round, anybody who is in the region with me, so I put my team as the plaintiffs, everybody that's also in our regions goes in that column. And then the other column becomes everybody else that came. And then I could just rotate back and forth. So I do worry about regional assignments. That's on my form, what region are you assigned to? They have to put the number in so that I know if they're together. Um, it tends to work really well. 
I do try to get an even number of teams. Last year I was this close to needing a buy round, but here's what you do. If you have an odd number of teams, you email all of your coaches and you say, do any of you have a 12 member team? And then you run the plaintiffs and defense as, as two different teams and schedule them that way. And then you've got yourself an even number of teams. And it works pretty well. Um, rooms to use. I also think about, I think about weird things. I think about what rooms my students should be speaking in. Because they're classrooms, it's not really a courtroom situation, but I try to get them as close to a courtroom as possible. And here's how I do it. I find a room with a carpet that helps with acoustics. I find a room that is larger with high ceilings. That's another acoustical issue. Students are too used to, in our practices, being in a small room and talking to somebody across the table. So I make it set up so that the people, the lawyers sit way in back. It'd be a room about the size, lawyers sit way in back. The um, court case is actually going on up here and they have to talk across the room. I also look for a room that can be difficult to maneuver and because some courtrooms are very difficult to maneuver. And so I want them to learn a little bit of grace as they try to go around different areas. Um, one of the biggest thing that actually throws off my students at regionals is getting up from a table because the big chairs on carpet stick and they've never experienced that before. So I try to put them in a room with carpet with chairs that'll stick and then they learn because boy, that nothing throws off a kid than not, especially that third lawyer, you know, one, two, three, that one in the middle, how the heck do you get out without killing yourself in your high heels and skirt and having your chair stuck. So I try to get rid of all of those things that happen usually on regional day by doing it during the scrimmage. All right, other considerations. Buses cost a lot. And for those that, you don't, that don't know it, they do. We go six miles down the road for three hours and it costs us $65. Um, if we go an hour away for about three hours, we're looking at a $300 bill. And it doesn't come out of my mock trial account, but it does come out of the district accountant. And in the straits that our schools are in right now, I, I pray that they just keep signing off on my bus requests. But be picky about where you go for your scrimmages and make sure that your scrimmages are meaningful so that you're getting the most bang for your buck. We also need to make sure that we understand our students are super busy and it's not just stuff in school. Dodge County is great in that they started this whole sheriff's thing with students where the kids go in and they do mock trials with the sheriff's department, they do paintballing with the SWAT team, they do all this other stuff, but those are my mock trial kids that they're taking away. And so I now compete with an outside source. Um, and I also compete with 4-H and all these uh, church groups and all these other things that kids do. Building use for school does usually require paperwork and a lot of communication. I use an area of my building that I don't teach in. I use the middle school wing. There is nothing that will get your colleagues angrier at you than holding something in their room that they didn't know was happening. And so I start now, as soon as I put in my building request, which will happen tomorrow for my scrimmage, I will email the teachers, looking ahead, put on your schedule, blah. Then a week ahead of time, I'll remind them of it. Three days ahead of time, I'll remind them of it. The day before, I'll remind them of it. And then on Monday afterwards, I'll send them an email thanking them for allowing us to use their room, asking if there are any problems with how we left it. And by doing all that communication, they find it very hard to be mad at me about anything. So <laughs> we've never had a problem either. So, but communication's the key there. And of course, keep your custodial staff happy. Bring some donuts with you. It'll help. Um, and what I actually do is my students will clean the rooms before we leave. Um, actually, I usually ask the teams to do that. They straighten it all up. They put everything on the floor into the garbage if there is anything left. All the custodians then have to do is go and grab garbage cans. And then they're done. And so they aren't sitting there all day or all night cleaning up after us either. So our scrimmage, I'm looking at either the 12th or the 9th for, 19th, for those of you who are interested. You can't expect me to talk about scrimmages and not invite you guys. Um, I'm looking at the 12th or the 19th. Here are the advantages and disadvantages. The advantage of the 12th is that that should not be a weekend before finals. The disadvantage of the 19th is that it is probably the week before finals. Um, the problem with the 12th is that you're probably only back in school for a week before you would go to the scrimmage. The advantage of the 19th is that you're back for a couple weeks. Um, both of them are available right now at our school. I'm not really sure which one I'm going to put in for. I might put in for them both and just cancel one later on and then hear from you guys to see what you like. I do normally start round one at 
about 10-ish is round two, about 11.45-ish is lunch. I go on ish time, all my science students know that. Ish is a very scientific term, that's why I use it. Um, yeah, we like using ish time. In fact, they call it ish time. Uh, afternoon is based on the lunch time, and we are usually done by 3.30 or so. And with the people who travel, I've had some travel as far as an hour and a half away. They're home by five, which is pretty nice. They still have date night, so life is good for them. Um, and then, like I said, the invitation will be coming soon via our listserv. So I think that's all I have, if, unless anybody has any questions. Why do I go through all that? <laughs> I am nuts. If, if any of you, <laughs> I always quote Big Bang Theory. I always tell my students, I'm not crazy. My mother had me tested. Um, <laughs> No, I, I am not crazy. Actually, poor Janelle, every year she'll comment on me because my taglines after my name on my email is longer than the pages. Um, why do you do this all? I don't know. I'm a glutton for punishment. I don't know. But I do encourage, I mean, gosh, if I had so many schools that I couldn't hold it in my middle school wing and I had to hold it in the high school wing, I would love it. I would absolutely love it. And um, my administrator, my district administrator, this, uh, the um, Superintendent, all three of her kids were four-year mock trial participants. Her husband is a DA, and uh, she is supportive of me using that of using the school. They're actually my board is very supportive as well because they like having the school open as much as possible. Anytime you can get the public in our school, they love it. So, yeah, I'm lucky. I'm lucky. Thank you for doing. Oh, sure. Good. I'm glad you liked. I, how did the um, laid-back atmosphere work out? I mean, and I think it takes the the pain away from them of the straight jackets and you know, especially when I walk in and I'm in jeans and my sweatshirt for the day. I think that kind of sets the scene that hey, you're here to do great things, but it's okay to talk, it's okay to mess up, it's okay you know, for your lawyer or coach to pull you out of the room after your testimony to give you some quick hints. It's, you know, it's really a working day, it's a workshop more than anything. Um, the other thing that I also suggest as far as the nighttime ones, if you can get a nighttime one in before Christmas break, that has helped us immensely. And Janelle can attest to that as well. She and I usually, and then I don't know if Beaver Dam's coach is here today. Um, it looks like I'll be teaming up with Beaver Dam as well before then. But that one before Christmas, it gives them a deadline. Otherwise, they will let things linger until all of a sudden it's February, and they're going, oh, well, I haven't written my opening yet. Oh, tough. You had to have one written back in December already. We're mean. We are mean. We, we look at them and say, tough. My f and we do usually cut out opens and closes on that pre, but we don't tell our students that. We say, are we doing the whole thing? Yep. You're doing it twice. You're being both sides. Oh. Because, boy, it makes January a lot easier, especially with final exams in there in January, and forensics is starting, and debate is ending, and oh my gosh, it's nuts. January is nuts, and I don't think the kids realize it till they're in it either. <laughs> We've had some of those, haven't we? <laughs> And if you're willing to come by me, I usually get the courthouse for that one. They were that, that week before Christmas, they're not usually busy, and so I can get the courthouse in. And Dodge County usually isn't all that busy anyhow. They, they have a lot of cases that are canceled. I mean, they're busy, but it's usually, they're done by 3, 4 o'clock in the afternoon. So it's not like Dayton County. <laughs> so any other questions or comments? All righty, thank you.